Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the Lead the Future podcast. I'm Vince Molinaro, and I am joined once again uh, with Tom Peters. Tom, it's an honor to have you here again, and thanks for making time. And today we're going to be talking about your newest book, uh, the Tom Peters Compact Guide to Excellence. And a question I always ask of authors uh, when they join the podcast is what motivated you to write this book? You co-authored it with Nancy Green. I would love to know uh, the motivation behind it. Well, I'm going to begin with a smart aleck remark. Having produced in 1992 Liberation Management with 900 pages and oversized, I thought the time had come for an undersized book that's thin. Uh, but there is some truth to that because it is book number 20. It is meant to be a summary of a summary of a summary. I had the great gift from God of being paired up or having the opportunity to work with Nancy Green, who on everybody's list is one of the top 100 designers in the planet. And I've been talking about design for 10 or 15 years. And with any luck, you and I can talk about it a teeny bit. But what she did was she didn't quote unquote design the book. It is the look, feel, taste, touch, smell. Yeah. It is the book, particularly yeah. in, in this instance. And so that's that's a huge part of it. Uh, you know, I was just signing a couple books for people. And I said, you know, I said my little my, my little one liner that I put in is one more bloody time trying to transmit this very simple message that people don't seem to be able to figure out how to implement. Yeah. And, you know, it's a it, it's true. My again, my throwaway line is, you know, I've got four degrees, all technical degrees, good schools. But if you want to understand what I'm writing, you must show me a signed certificate of completion from the third grade. Uh, you know, this, this ain't, to use yeah. that wildly overused phrase, this yeah. ain't rocket science. It's about yeah. taking care of people. It's about producing fabulous stuff rather than the cheapest and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and in many ways, you know, what we've gone through in the last few years uh, has amplified that focus on, that's always been a core message of, of, of yours around people first, right? It's even more critical now. And, and that's what's important. What I also found um, and congrats both to you and Nancy, is this isn't, you know, a summary of a summary of a summary, in my opinion. Uh, you go through it, and particularly because the ideas are, are really consolidated in a very focused way, it, I just found myself really thinking hardly, uh, you know, really intently about those ideas. And so the reader is going to get a kind of a renewed uh, sense of understanding. So, you know, you asked one question or you make a statement in the book that I want to start off with where you say, you know, a business is a, is a community. Um, and, and tied to that is there is no business excellence without community excellence. And you say, think about that. And I did. And I'd love to kind of get your sure. thinking about A, this idea of community, which is important to our work, we spoke a little bit about it last time, but how are you thinking about that, particularly in light of what's happening today in the world? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, you've made my day because that's precisely the way that I hope the book will be looked at. Pick one that makes sense and either, you know, while you're daydreaming or while you're dreaming or if you're working in an active enterprise with two or three of your colleagues, have a lunch and talk about it. So that's that's heaven on earth. Uh, well, first of all, the logic doesn't require a th more than a third grade unless you were born with the so-called silver spoon in your mouth. You are going to spend most of your adult waking hours at work. You love your family. You adore your family. But statistically, more hours at work than any place else. And so if the work life and work world does not reflect the values that your mama and papa taught you and so on. And there's nothing inconsistent with making money, incidentally, but we can come back to that. Uh, I mean, it's like, duh, the, you know, and, and we live within communities and, you know, you add up the people who work and, you know, and, and one thing we also have to say is, uh, and this is particularly true since it's coming from Canada, is, you know, let's get over the Fortune 500 and the FTSE 100. 
only 7% of the, of the American workforce works for the Fortune 500. And the essence of economic strength, you know, from Toronto to Quebec to Baltimore is, is the small and medium-sized companies. And the joy of that for me is I think if I get lucky, I can make a difference yeah. with a person running a 15-person company who says, oh, my God. You know, I ought to do it this way. So, you know, God bless the people in the big companies, but but they're not my focus. But so so it is the community. Those at the tiny business level, the 27 little shops on Main Street in the town of 2000, they're our brothers, our sisters, our fellow churchgoers, our, you know, Sunday or Saturday pinochle players or whatever it happens to be so it yeah. should be as obvious as the end of your nose and and, and, and all that you know speaking a, a little or or maybe even a lot more as an american than than a canadian given the crap that's going on in the u.s my perhaps wildly optimistic hypothesis is if people are engaged at work and feel that they're doing something worthwhile and working with a set of colleagues, they are a lot less likely to be red meat for the radicals. Interesting. And I'm not a sociology major, so I may be blowing smoke, but I think that's pretty obvious. You know, the statistics yeah. say that make a damn bit of difference whether we are in Sri Lanka, Canada, or the United States, 20% yeah. of workers are engaged. And given my math degrees, that means 80% are not engaged. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that research, you know, on engagement and like you, I, I've, I've kept track of it for, for a few decades now really hasn't, hasn't dramatically no. changed, right? At any given well, time. Me was the fact that it was so, you know, the standard deviation worldwide is yeah. you know, about that yeah. much. Yeah, and, and to me, that's, the, you know, I think for me personally, that's the motivation for this work, right? It's sort of the passion around helping companies be as successful as they can be and create, you know, meaningful places for people to do their best work because this isn't, uh, you know, I don't see a dichotomy between your work life and your personal life. It's one life. And, yeah, I was just going to edit a sentence. Yeah, yeah go Not ahead. to do their best work, to be their best selves. Well, that, to be yeah. their best selves at work, yeah. uh, as they as they are at home as a deacon in the local Presbyterian church. Yeah, so you you, you jumped ahead because what I was going to say as well, but we also see in our work when we you know help leaders be more effective is we're not just helping them be better managers, we're helping them be better people. Yeah. So that when they go home, the skills that they've learned. Uh, for the workplace, they can use, you know, with that teenage son or daughter, uh, with their significant other. And, and that, I think, is, is we've got to come back to those core ideas. But what you also do is you speak about, you know, it's not community as a, as a soft construct. And you've spoken a lot about hard versus soft. So we won't get into that. But you, you, I, I also found compelling that other part to the quote around there is no business excellence without community excellence. And I think that that is, from my vantage point, a gap in the thinking of some, you know, uh, senior business leaders. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but say more about that connection between business excellence and community excellence. Well, one, trivial, it's not trivial at all. One of the toughest parts of writing a book is picking the epigraph. You know, what's two sentences that summarize the book? And I picked an epigraph by the late Dame Anita Roddick, right. a body shop founder. And one of the many things that she was famous for was all the body shop employees from store manager to the person who was sorting boxes in the back had to spend 20% of their time on community service right. directly. And, you know, I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, to go back to another theme for the accountants who are watching, good for business yeah you know when you when you're good for your community your community is the majority of your customers uh and, and by the way i i think it even holds for that 200 million or billion dollar company I, it, it's not like people are important that's what the hell the organization is right you know it's people with a little bit of software and a couple of brick buildings yeah. it's not gosh people are important 
I mean, that's what just irritates the heck out of me. That is the, you know, would a preacher understand what people are important means? He wouldn't yeah. know, know what the hell you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, preacher or teacher. Yeah. So, and, and by the way, because I want to make not a segue, we'll, we can come back to it. Uh, there's a, another practical implication, in my opinion. The best products, the greatest products, the most exciting products, not the effing cheapest products. Right. The goal, I mean, sure, you can be flabby as the Dickens, and maybe you ought to take a little bit of cost out here and that, and God bless the accountants for beating us over the head. But, you know, in so many, particularly the giant firms, in order to meet the quarterly shareholder value necessity, we cut the crap out of everything yeah. from health benefits. I mean, you guys have universal, ours are anything but universal. Uh, health benefit in, in the United States, this is going astray. One of the things that angers me worst, most, is the two principal causes of personal bankruptcy are health and education. Yeah. You know, let me stick my fingers in my mouth and throw up all over the screen. I mean, that's just an awful, awful, awful statement. But I mean, it's like everything else I've said. Why the hell should I have to tell you that this is a community? Of course, it's a community. Yeah. What, what else is it? And, you know, some people say, well, it's not your family. Well, yeah. you spend more time than, you know, I'm not talking about yeah. a, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a and, and again, the other part, you know, I remember years and years ago, I was doing some work with Xerox. And talking to this guy who was a super salesman, and he said the most important thing as a salesman is not to pay any attention to attention to the quarterly company incentives. He said my life over the long term is the quality of relationships, right. and personally established relationships right. with my customer. I'm not going to try to shove down their throats a. Twenty nine ninety nine item for twenty two twenty nine for the next thirty days because I'm in it for the long haul with those customers. And the same thing is true with the vendors. So you know we can expand and, and particularly now, uh, for God's sakes, the planet's part of it. Well, you know, it's you, yeah. It's, so let's 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 build on that. That just focus on relationships because I, I wanted to go there, but you 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 already got there because you also have a quote from Bill George where he says, you know, the capacity to develop close and enduring relationships is a mark of a leader. And, and we find in our work, my team's work in helping companies build a stronger sense of community among leaders. Uh, I know that you can't build community among a group of strangers. Uh, like you, you, there's got to be some foundational relationships there. And then there's the research recently that uh, MIT reported on that most senior leaders uh, and by most, it's it's like 66% say that the relationships at work are superficial at best, and most of them have a hard time building meaningful relationships with their peers and colleagues. In addition, our own research that we're just starting to put out in the marketplace reveals that regardless of company performance, high performers, low performers, uh, leaders admit that uh, forming strong relationships is a gap. And so I think I'd love to get your perspective on that because th this sense of, as you said, right, it's it's business uh, business excellence, community excellence, and in many ways, it's got to be tied to relationship excellence um, and that ability to build trusting, uh, enduring relationships as you speak of. What, what's your sense on that? Well, I want to talk about it on not two dimensions, but I want to yeah. say one shout, scream in the face of everybody who's listening, watching. And others have said this, the two most important sets of decisions that the leaders make is hiring and promoting. Right. You know, there's a biotech company CEO who I quote in this business, and he says, we only hire nice people or we'll screw up our culture. And that's not coming from a Kentucky Fried Chicken person who's serving chicken one piece at a time to customers. As he said, he said, you can't even understand the name of some of the degrees that people right. in R&D and biotech have. But he said, that, he said, I made this breakthrough conclusion. I don't care how obscure the degrees are. There are a lot of people who have them hire the nice ones. 
So that's really, really, really huge. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of either the book or the author, but there was a fabulous book about five years ago that was all about hiring per se. And one thing he said was that virtually no managers are expert in hiring. Mm -hmm. And if they're in bigger companies, they just say, let HR take care of that. And the second half then of that is uh, the promotion process. I argue in this book and otherwise that the number one corporate asset from the small car dealership to TD Bank uh, is the quality of the front line leaders. Yeah. It affects productivity, it affects quality, it affects profitability. Give me a variable and the first line leader quality is the lead parameter uh, in that variable. So we will have gone a long way down the path that you're talking about if we are really, really, really serious about those two things. And I ask all of our, all of our managers, leaders who are watching us, can you, without crossing your fingers, say, I am an expert in hiring? Right. Uh, and, you know, I don't think all that many of us, and, you know, I have my own teeny business and had a bigger business. I, I don't think I, I don't think I qualify. Well, and then, you know, and in today, you know, I think it's a really, a, we're not expecting the conversation to go here, which is great, uh, is, you know, there's a, there's a sense for some to hire for likeness. So let me hire a person that kind of looks like me, has my background, uh, reminds me of me, which is usually not a good way forward. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think we've got to be thinking more about, you know, I think it gets back to kind of, you know, your responsibility and obligation to the business around ultimately, you know, at, particularly at the frontline level, like you say, most most organizations, 70 to 80% of the employee base of an entire organization reports in through those frontline leaders in many ways. So they are absolutely critical. And their ability to, you know, hire and promote the right folks. Um, and even before that, invest time in developing them, uh, grooming them, giving them confidence so that they can expand and, and, and have a desire to pursue leadership roles if that's what they want or continue down a technical path. It doesn't matter as long as they're adding value. Those really become, you know, become really, uh, really critical skills that we need to um you know, in part, but I'm, I'm curious because, you know, you're right. And, and I don't necessarily want to be a devil's advocate. That's a big part of your, your job, but it's a tension that I see, particularly right now. And I'd love your perspective on, and it, it's certainly at the front line, at the mid level as well, even senior leaders, many are, are feeling certainly over the last, you know, two to three years of what we've gone through are feeling tired. You know, their, their tank is, is, is running low. And yet there's even more expectation on their ability to support their, their own teams, invest in their development, create diversity. You kind of speak a, a lot in the book, you and Nancy, about the power of women uh, as leaders in our organizations. Um, that I think is completely a massive opportunity for us to, to explore further um, in our companies. But, but how, how are you resolving that? kind of tension yeah. between leaders kind of some on the verge of burnout and there's some research, many are dropping like flies. Women are, 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 are stepping away from leadership roles. What's your, what's your sense on that? Well, two things. I want to go back to your hiring thing for a minute. And I hadn't really thought of it this way, except I'm writing a foreword for an amazing book right now. I don't want to hire anybody who doesn't make me a little uncomfortable. Right. I don't want a mini me. Yeah. I want somebody who in the conversation, I'm, I'm, and I don't care what the job is again. Uh, I learned something from them. They're talking about something in a slightly different way. And so I want to be a teeny bit scared of them in the, in the best sense of, of that word. Yeah. Uh, obviously, to give you a 30 second answer on burnout. Uh, well, one thing, I've always felt is the leader, particularly again in a, you know, hundred per, you know, my focus is on hundred person companies, not thousand person companies. The leader ought to really know the people yeah. who report to her or him. 
And I said, here's, here's my definition. Um, I've got a group that I'm the leader of, Zoom days. We have a weekly meeting or even a bi-weekly meeting, and it's time for evaluations. And I'm sitting down from, with Mary, who is absolutely fabulous. And I say to Mary, maybe I'm gonna give you one little teeny black mark. And the black mark is your attendance is perfect and you're always on. And I said, my dirty little secret, which Mary, you and I know, is I know that you've got a parent in assisted living and I know that you've got two youngsters. So do me the world's greatest favor, miss a few meetings, and don't consider productivity to be the main thing that I'm measuring on. So, you know, I think it's that kind of an attitude. And I've talked to yeah. people about that idea and, you know, and they really agree. I mean, you know, just one trivial thing, but I think it's in the same direction. And I know people can push back at me and that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you got 11 people reporting to you and you don't know the first name of all their kids, I got a problem with you. Right. you know, again, I'm not asking you to, you know, get under the covers or anything like that. But you know, when I look at you, I'm looking at the whole person. And by the way, I want terrific ideas and I want terrific energy and I'm going to get it from the, from the whole person. So um, I think burnout is dealable, withable, uh, by looking at the sanity of the schedules that people are confronting, confronted with, uh, by if you're a leader at a second or third level, do we really need seven meetings or could we have two? And this might surprise a lot of people who are listening and, and watching. Uh, I have no idea what company X's policy is, but I'm happy as a lark if all of you work from home three days a week. Right. I've got a very close friend who's about to accept probably a very senior state level government job. And we were talking and she shocked me. You know, at the level almost of state cabinet officers, people are doing three days from home. Yeah. So, and you know, that's that's a senior, senior, senior position. And so, you know, I can't imagine I'm sitting here pushing work at home, uh, but it is, we're, we're just, in the, you know, the pandemic triggered it, but we're just yeah. in the beginning of, of going down this path. And the thing you said earlier about relationships, you and I are going to have to figure out how to have fabulous, productive, innovative relationships with people who we've only met twice and who are Zooming to work four days a week. Yeah. You know, just, you know, A, get over it, B, get your head around it, yeah. you know, C, and I don't mean you should see a shrink, but, you know, sort of, and maybe in your reading and so yeah. on, is, is talk about what it means with somebody who really does understand uh, yeah. human beings. And it doesn't have to be a shrink with a capital S and a degree, but somebody who spent their life developed, talk, talk, and, you know, I'm not, I don't go to church very much. I never used to. I mean, I did used to a long time ago, but, you know, talk to a preacher or a priest, talk to, if you're in a good town, a police chief, talk to people who, you know, yeah. know the essence of what human beings are. And a lot of people, and particularly, again, back to those damned first-line hiring decisions, that's yeah. not their strength. Yeah. You know, I'm but not going to require, well, incidentally, by the way, totally related to this, I summarize it in the book and said more in my last book. I don't care how techy your business is, give me liberal arts grads. I need some technical people, but the research, there is a Canadian by the name of Henry Mintzberg, who I adore, is yeah. one of the top five worldwide in analyzing organizations. And he did this research that shows when the drama major, we won't say drama because maybe she or he's headed for Hollywood, uh, when the English major graduates, statistically, they're going to get half as many offers at half the price as Tom Peters, the civil engineering graduate. Right. But dirty little secret or clean secret, by the year 20 of their career, they have soared past Tommy Narrow-Minded. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so literally, I don't, you know, if, if the team is, is, that, is, is that your nickname, Tommy, Tommy Narrow-Minded? 
doesn't have at least one drama major or music major, right. I want to suggest that you're screwing up. I'm sorry, I was just uh, joking there. Uh, is Tommy narrow-minded your nicknames that your friends and family call you? I hope to God. Yeah, it is at some level. <laughs> you know, I said people were important in 1982. I yeah. haven't changed my tune. Good for you. Not enough people have gotten it. So I would guess I'm one of the most narrow-minded people that you have ever interviewed. Well, and, and you know, and I, and I think it's, um, you know, a critical a critical point because I think the, the issue of, of burnout is also tied to the concept of community. I think, you know, what I see is there's still this, and I'd love your perspective on it. I think this hero model of leadership is still entrenched. And it, it kind of, you know, moves leaders to um, have to feel like they've got to figure it out all on their own. Yeah. They've got to carry the weight all on their own. There's clearly a, a part of that in leadership, but it prevents them from reaching out. I, you know, when I, uh, in, in grad school, I worked uh, with a prof who specialized in organizational development. And I asked him, uh, what's the one question you've learned to ask of an organization that tells you the, the most about its culture immediately. And uh, he was in his 70s at the time, and uh, David uh, paused uh, in a very pensive way as he normally does and said, ask this, ask, how is asking for help viewed in the organization? Because if it's, it's seen as a weakness, then no one's going to ask for help, everyone's going to try to be the hero, and relationships and community doesn't get formed. But if it's seen as a strength, <laughs> Uh, a lot is possible. And it was such a brilliant, brilliant question that I always pay attention to. And I think that's, you know, I think community is the way forward um, to help leaders and help employees deal with some of the stressors they're, and pressures they're dealing with today. Because well, they the they're there. We can't, we can't deny it. They're there for sure. Yeah. I would say, I think the answer that you were given is right on the money. Yeah. And another thing that, that kind of is implied, and again, in this book that I'm writing a forward to, is the leader who knows everything knows nothing. Right. Uh, the job of a leader is to be surprised. You know, Tom Peters went down as a salesperson, and he went down a slightly different alley with Charles Schwab, and look at how the business has grown. And so I need to be surprised by the people who work for me yeah. every day, or at least yeah. every other day. They've discovered something that wasn't in my portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm hearing stuff back that I understand, I made the wrong hires, the wrong promotions, and I'm a jerk. So I, uh, let, let's start bringing our, this is a great conversation, could go on for hours, but we can't. Because a, a big, I think a big part here moving forward in all of this is the, the role and responsibility of the leadership development industry. And I'm curious as someone has, you know, has been in the industry for the better part of your career, and the same with me, it's, a, it's an industry I'm passionate about, um, but there are issues with it. And I'm curious, what advice would you have for people in the leadership development industry on how they need to um, you know, support companies of all sizes and leaders and their employees? Don't sell a cookie cutter package. Leadership development people are in the business which has the most uncertainty, which has the least hard parts. And when I'm looking to consider you as a client, or you're looking to consider me, for a job, I want you and I to, you're, you will or won't bring me in. I want you and I to have exactly the conversation that you and I have had in the last 40 minutes. You know, we talk about community, we talk about family, we talk about the fact that we don't know everything. You know, we talk about, you know, the number of times we interrupt because we're bosses and so on. And I, I want you and I, you're selling, I'm or sorry, I'm selling, you're buying. And I choose this word with care. I want you and I at the end of that half hour, and you can hire me or not, but to have an intimate relationship or on the basis of it. It's a funny thing, I'm going to really digress. Most important day in my professional life 
during the research for In Search of Excellence was the day that my colleague Bob Woodman and I went down to Hewlett Packard, which was then a much smaller and more exciting company. And from their president, John Young, we learned about MBWA, managing by wandering around. And the reason for bringing that little example in is I really feel this way. What I learned from MBWA, and I'm really choosing my words with care, leadership is an intimate act, right. an intimate act. And obviously you're welcome to misinterpret it if you want to. And I'm not talking about me too-ism obviously, but it, 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 it is. And particularly, you know, given the next step in this process, if we want to develop services and products that surprise people, you know, the, in the design thing, I was, was uh, writing and I found this review, the, the, uh, the Mini Cooper 6 or the Mini Cooper 7. And, and the, the, the reviewer said, no car has ever produced so many smiles. Now that is the best product right. recommendation I have ever, ever, ever heard. For a car. So, you know, this, so that's, that's, that's my advice. Awesome. You know, you, know awesome. you are not, I mean, I don't think Kentucky Fried Chicken ought to be either. You're not selling a package. You're selling, the, you know, leadership development is the ultimate human act. And, you know, if you're not, if that's not reflected in the relationship that I develop with you on day one, who's the potential customer, we're effed up. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Tom, thank you so much for making time of your busy, in your busy schedule for us today. Another great conversation. I really do appreciate how you just keep inspiring so many of us. So thank you for that. And thank you for your team for all the behind the scenes work in, in setting this up. I wish you continued success uh, uh, with, uh, with your book uh, that you and Nancy Green uh, co-authored uh, in your compact guide to uh, excellence. So thank you so much, Tom. Uh, wish you all the best. Have a great 2023. Thank you very much. And I return the great 2023. And uh, this has been as pleasant. It's been a... God, I hate this word and I hate it when people, it's been a spiritual 40 minutes where we've really dug pretty deep into the essence of human beings. And again, I do not say that as a religious person. I'm a very lapsed, lapsed Presbyterian. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a mini evangelist, evangelist I, I assure you. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you so Take much. Take care.